So in the first session, Dr. Olog will provide the foundation and overview for finding the truth. So very much looking forward to this session. So over to you, Dr. Olog. Namaste, James and all brothers and sisters, co-travelers, friends on the path of truth. Why do we need to even bother about finding the truth? For the very simple reason that without really knowing the truth, our life itself doesn't really carry sense, meaning, purpose, direction. And it's the very nature of the human mind to feel, to orient itself. For the animal, it's not necessary. He lives in the moment's impulse and instinct. But one of the signs of our humanity is that we raise questions. Why, when, where, what, who, how? Because we need to orient ourselves. Where have we come from? Where are we going? Why are we where we are? Why are things the way they are? And in uh, this search, it has a very interesting uh, aspect to it. Uh, in times when we were growing up as children, we were um, asked to believe in whatever parents said and whatever our religious book has written and take it as an axiomatic truth. If we shut ourselves, however great and profound, a formula of life may be or a belief system may be, then there is really speaking no search but a belief. But search means either we verify the things that we have received from those who have gone before us in our own consciousness, in our own experience and thereby validate it. Or else we make an original query and go ahead with the staff of faith and aspiration to discover what lies at the bedrock of existence. So let's first completely uh, understand the difference between a religious teaching and the search for truth. A religious teaching may be true. It may be derived from a true experience. But if our mind shuts it into a bracketed formula, then we may well turn that beautiful, high, profound vision into a very small, narrow dogmatic creed or maybe even worse a distorted understanding of what that reality is so it has happened it has happened it's still happening and mankind suffers because of that so in today's age this thing which has come up which is uh, something very beautiful because it cuts through the religious mind and the scientific mind the secular mind as well as the and the ideological mind it is what is truth. So, we can have this search starting with some kind of a um, basic formula which has come to us from those who have gone before us whom we can trust ourselves and we start with that formula and reproduce in our consciousness. For instance, there are ways of meditation where we start uh, by a meditation upon an idea. This idea can be the divine is in all and then we meditate upon it till one day the power of our concentration opens the ideas to the reality that it represents. So this is something very beautiful about um, Indian thought that it doesn't stop at a belief system. A belief system can be a starting point that there is God but we pick up any one aspect and we end up growing toward that and we discover that reality by kind of power of concentration. Every idea is nothing but a door. And initially, this door is covered by very brilliant formations. So you see, when we touch an idea, uh, many kinds of lights begin to play around us. Meaning thereby you can pick up the same idea and write books based on the light that comes from that idea. And many people do indeed stop there because it's a door of luminous formations. Brilliant lid, if one may 
use the word so for instance when we take up that god is in all and if we really meditate upon that idea from the door itself we can extract so much and write so much and believe again we may be led into believing that we have found but we have not really found we have to go past this door of brilliant formations or the brilliant lid uh, call it whatever and see it in its naked body so this is what is originally meant in the um spiritual sense as to discovering truth meaning thereby what is it at the bedrock of the entire creation so this is uh, how the uh, ancient spiritual seers seekers even now search for it what is it what is the source of creation why do we need to search this search may the starting point may be simply when we look around our life and the life of those uh, of this world we may be impelled to seek is there really any truth behind all this now why this is important is that if there is really speaking no truth no bedrock of existence if all is simply nothingness as it is said all is a random chance play of uh, accidents then frankly speaking leading one kind of life vis-a-vis -vis another has very little meaning so it is a great bearing search for truth has a bearing on our own life how we live what are we supposed to do will depend upon what this truth is that we discover if there is no such truth which endures the rub and change of time then obviously life has no sense you have to just flow as life carries us and there are number of people who believe that quest for truth is nothing but uh, uh, a kind of mental pursuit of those who have lot of time to think and meditate and you know think about abstruse problems but it has nothing to do with real life on the contrary truth has to do very much intimately with real life and i can tell you this uh, i can share on a very personal vein uh, in my own life the quest started like that so when i looked all around and i saw as a doctor so many people who are uh, you know sick and unhealthy and i had my own um, you know karma theory and people are sick and there is god but this karma this is not a satisfactory explanation and for me it was important to know what i am doing and why am i here and why is all this sickness so it can anything can be a starting point uh, which can trigger us such so it it's it need not be confined to a classical approach classical approach is that okay we read a text vedantic text or a you know well written book and we start seeking anything can be a starting point for me the starting point was like people are suffering and people say that god has made this world but how can he make a world which is suffering it's a very common question that youngsters seek but they don't have the patience to search and very often they are satisfied with the uh, explanations based on just a superficial understanding of life uh, so first thing required is if you want to search for why things are the way they are then we have to go deeper and deeper very patiently till we test the last bedrock of, of existence so one approach to to search for truth is why raise this question why why about everything and if you really go back into go into the details of this why then we will end up searching or finding at least the original cause because there are three levels at which causes exist one is the immediate cause the second is the intermediate cause and the third is the ultimate cause so here truth refers to the ultimate cause take for example it's there in khal jibran's one of his stories where a child has died and the father asks the doctor why has my child died and he says because of very infinitesimally small little uh, particles which are called as viruses he has died he says he cannot imagine that my child who is grown up human you know much more than what a little virus can be and he dies because of that so he goes to a priest and he goes and asks the priest that well why did my child die then the priest says it is the will of the infinite so the man says somewhere between the infinite and the infin infinitesimal my child has been lost now you see what happens is are is one person right or the other no both are right one is the immediate cause the immediate cause is the virus whatever our understanding of virus may be 
The other is the ultimate cause. Everything ultimately goes back to the will of the infinite. And there are range of intermediate causes which are like a complex play of forces that weave the texture and technology of this universe. And all the three levels we have to discover truth. So it's not enough just to simply raise the question why we may go back and say all is the will of God. But then it uh, doesn't really um, truly explain because you know to say that a child died because it was God's will uh, makes God into really a monster. Who is this God who is uh, busy picking up you know people at will and taking him uh, back to somewhere and leaving everybody dying, uh, crying and um, uh, you know with grief. So who is this God? So ne the next question that comes which is connected with the why is how. So in how we see all the processes that are in between. So the same story of the dead person, one can try to understand the how. So when we understand the how, we will say immediately that, well, the, the person died because of the you know, cardiac arrest. Then you go still deeper. You say, okay, there was cholesterol, there was blood pressure. So then you go still deeper. Then you discover that, well, there was a kind of disharmony in his being. He was under stress. Why was he stressed? Because he had a certain attitude. He had a certain worldview and self-view and that put him under stress. So why was he having such a worldview and attitude? Then you go and discover that it is because of his state and level of consciousness. Then you go into what happens when there is a state and level of consciousness. Then you say, well, certain forces are attracted based on our, our attitude. So you see the whole how and you see that between the infinite and us and the creation, there is a whole range of uh, layers and levels through which truth acts and all of them are part of an um, you know, inextricable chain and we need to understand the chain. So we have the why and we have the how. Then we have the what. So what itself is very interesting. What is it that killed a person? So we can say that, well, it's a virus. That's what was going around. I'm taking this example. It can apply to anything and anywhere. What exactly is this piece of paper? What exactly is this human body? You can take that example. That's a better example than a virus. What really is this human body? So we, will, we are told that it's nothing but material formation made out of you know, matter. Through evolution, this is what the human body is. So... Then the question arises that this matter, this dust, how has it developed the capacity to think and feel, etc.? Then we go layer by layer. What really is matter? So when we start raising the question, what really is matter? Then we'll see the matter itself is a condensation of something which we don't quite and It's a kind of energy which has precipitated itself, crystallized itself as matter. So what is this energy? so vague that we don't understand is it an unconscious material mechanical energy or is it something deeper is it conscious and by all logical conclusion we'll end up with that wonderful chapter of the life divine conscious force that's how the shankya this nature which is acting it's not just a blind mechanical thing there is a consciousness so it's a conscious force which has become this existence and has become this matter so it gives us another vantage point. Because if it's that conscious force which has become matter, by tapping into that conscious force, we can do things with this material formation which we call as the body, uh, which uh, can be mind-boggling. You know, Shubindu says, Almighty powers are shut in nature cells. And imagine if this conscious force can be brought out and activated into our system. If our system can be made ready to bear it, it opens doors to several possibilities. So we have the why, we have the how, we have the what. And then we have when. It's an important question. Why when is important? Because all play is taking place in time and space. So there we discover something very interesting. When did a person, when was the person born? Let's take, birth is being celebrated. So we give a date, 19 June 1960. <laughs> or whatever date you want to pick up. Take, for instance, now we are approaching, you know, uh, Mother and Sri is coming. When was Sri born? So, everybody has ready answer. 15th August, 1872. Morning, early morning, we are 4 or 4.30. Oh, that was the time Sri was born. So, you go further. When, when did the will to take birth start? 
now you are entering into another dimension altogether is shurabindu just a body which came into existence no there is that eternal shurabindu the eternal avatar who comes and takes a body sambhavami yuge yuge so when did the original will decide to take this human shape which we today know as shurabindu so there was a very interesting set of question answers somebody asked shurabindu yeah shurabindu um you have been mother also has said that she has been here upon earth since the formation of earth she never left the earth since its formation so this little boy nagin doshi ashur bindo sir in this life you are an avatar what were you in previous lives so he says that we were there as vibhutis so what were you doing as vibhutis carrying on the spiritual evolution sir what does it mean he says that Uh, to explain that we have to write the whole history of the earth so when mother describes shrivindo's birth she uses the word eternal birth and she says it is the birth of the eternal upon earth a birth which records from time to time from age to age a birth which will never be forgotten from the earth's history a birth which will have perennial repercussions on you know the entire this formation life on planet earth now when we look at it from that dimension of time then we understand that 15th august 1872 is the crystallization of an event which started from that moment when the divine said eko ham bahushyam the one will become the many and then through a series of number of births through aeons through pralayas through rise and fall of empires and civilizations where sri aurobindo is there how is he there somebody asked him sir asked the mother mother uh, was shurbindo there in the french revolution she said shurbindo has always been there in all the great revolutions and he was there during the french revolution but not necessarily in a human body so now it opens a new door of understanding with the moment we use the word when because we know only earthly time when did an event start and i take this another common example you see a you know people drive and let's say two vehicles collide with each other or let me let's make it a little more beautiful story why this accidental story a boy and a girl are coming from different directions they meet they fall in love and the rest is history thereafter i'm not going to fill in the blanks whether it's a beautiful history or a painful history or through the pain towards beauty now when did this event happen they say oh you know jab we met but if you look at even this movie jab we met how does it start it starts with an escapade why the escapade because of a certain situation and circumstances when did the event really begin when we go back ultimately we say it began at one point of time even probably beyond this birth lifetime so when when we start answering this question we have very interesting answers so we have why we have how we have what we have when what is left now <laughs> what when where where did it happen now this is another very interesting thing and we have a sixth one just keep it so where did the event happen you know this was how we were taught that in science you need to answer these six question but i found these questions are important everywhere yes the last is who so where did this event happen well it happened here and then you start exploring what is here and then you discover actually just by this small little thing if somebody has the seeking for truth one will discover several dimensions of space which are interlacing with each other it's fascinating discovery when did this where did this event occur have we not seen things in dream declaring themselves upon earth next day i i have experienced it i have even experienced then change So if somebody asks me that where did this event take place, sometimes I don't know where <laughs> it took place in the dream world, in some plane of existence of which right now I don't have the knowledge, but materially it manifested here. So where is normally when we use the word where we only talk about the material dimension, but there are several dimensions on which and through which the event manifests. Shubhendu you know, describes it in Savitri. in kingdoms of subtle matter how it comes sometimes a small little seed 
you know i have observed this in my own life i have observed in several lives that uh, you go back you know some people develop an illness and in their dream state in the dream world i mean they were not to uh, going through a rough patch and they had the bill to die several times and it took place as autoimmune disorder i have seen another very inter- red very interesting example there is this lady who was uh, terminal stage of cancer which had gone all over so um, she was going to die anyways doctors said couple of months uh, unfortunately you know she was also carrying a baby you know before it went into that stage and uh, they were doing experiment with uh, psychedelics which o- could be done only on those who were declared terminally ill and so this there in andrew wills book uh, i'm forgetting the name right now but people can go back and search for it so during the experiment she went into alternate state of consciousness where they asked her do you want the child they were experimenting because anyway she is going to die so habit formation was not a issue and suddenly she said yes now you know it was an impossible thing to have the child and she said yes then she came out and she started changing her life starting with changing her husband and changing her job changing her she she learned new things she changed the city where she was living and eventually 20 years down the line she was fine so where did the event start of the recovery was it in that hospital setting or was it in another dimension of consciousness where it was decided in a certain state of consciousness so when we start answering this question where this itself opens doors to infinite possibilities and then finally we have the most important question who in the entire yoga parlance if you ask well all these questions are important according to me it's not enough just to know who am i who am i is like a dismembered who am i i am an eternal soul and self yes it's a very important thing but to simply discover who am i uh, is not enough for living a life in the world i need to also know what am i doing here this is very and then how to do what i am doing where do i come from where am i going to place me in the context of the when in terms of time when i know i am the eternal soul the immortal soul on my upward path then it makes sense what am i doing today my death is only the beginning of a greater life but if this is the only moment where my life and death and destiny is decided then it's a different approach i'll take so who am i this is a very of course very important question perhaps the most important but this not the only question shubindu speaks about this question very beautifully who am i is not just about a person who is about everything the goddess of science so there is a very interesting poem of shubindu a vision of science where he describes all that is going to happen 100 years down the line this poem is 1900s so he speaks about electrical chariots electricity running our chariots and you know we have tapped the sun we have tapped the waters and all the resources religion is ousted so the goddess of religion governed the world so far it is going and there is a third spirit that is standing behind and this science is very happy and proud that look here you know religion your age is gone you are outnumbered now it's my age so religion while it's passing cautions science and it cautions this way thou thinkest term and end for thee are not you see all things manifest in time that's why you must know what is the eternal truth thou thinkest term and end for thee are not but though thou thy pride is great thou hast forgot the sphinx that waits for thee beside the way all questions thou mayest answer but one day her questions shall await thee that reply for they who cannot die she slays them and their mangled bodies lie upon the highways of eternity therefore if thou wouldst live answer first this one thing who art thou in this dungeon laboring so for example if i am just a gene and plasma and gas then what's the big deal why so many we feel proud and 
we feel there is something or you know it 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 takes the carpet from below the feet everything becomes absurd babel of neurons we call as truths and we write books on this we write you know sometimes i find it so funny and amusing i have had interaction with some scientists who believe that you know there is nothing like a reality or a god it's all just a, a chance accident and random events and i asked him at one point point blank so there is a chance random event fellow sitting out there with a chaotic babbling of brilliant babbling of neurons formed randomly and accidentally in his brain but who believes he knows the reality which is non reality so he was too much shaken by the complexity of the words so i said yes sir reality is one but it is also complex and you have to reckon with all these things layers so how do we find this reality most important thing is one single thing not to stop to aspire to aspire what is that last bedrock mother describes in a beautiful story and in this play it's a play and she describes something very interesting any part of us can actually find the truth see in vedanta you use the mind you meditate upon an idea and find but in mother's story which i i can put it like it is tantra raised to its ultimate possibility what is tantra after all you go through nature all its possibilities and then finally ascend now this is another kind of tantras and shubindu writes in savitri each part in us desires its absolute any which part you approach you can find truth including the senses ordinarily we are told that if you want to find the truth don't be carried in the snare of sense which is true because senses are all the time lost in appearances but the very same senses can be upgraded purified refined refined what are the senses seeking through sight and sound delight the rasa it is trying to catch it it is trying to what are the senses actually doing they are weaving they are partly uh, you know they partly weave build reality so if the senses are very crude they build crude realities crude worlds if the senses are refined they start building beautiful reality images of reality so when these senses begin to seek search they will reach a point where they are like an artist artist automatically goes into a world of refined senses what we call as imaginations are nothing but what what do we imagine we imagine a beautiful image we imagine beautiful sounds we imagine a beautiful smell and well art can capture a little bit in painting but let's say a uh you know a movie maker he tries to bring at least sight sound he cannot bring touch taste and smell but maybe by the intensity of things he tries to give us some foretaste of a world of imagination but sight and sound are so important so in a world of imagination he constructs a reality and that reality has the power of precipitating upon earth so through senses we can approach as an artist does or we can approach the same senses uh, same reality through a widening of our heart love for humanity so there are philanthropists who want to help humanity and through that they approach and eventually when they do that they just find their heart widening then there is the scientist who is approaching what is the how is the scientist approaching through the senses and the rational mind he wants to analyze essay and eventually try to find and then there is of course the heart of the lovers who are looking their idea of reality the same reality but they are seeking in a different way they are wanting to realize a dream of ideal love and perfect union between human beings and that is also a seeking for truth in fact if you take the hierarchy through which mother makes these different characters go through and it is like all these characters meet together and they say that uh, you know i you know each of them meet so there is a chance meeting so um, the student says we are here learning and we are trying to you know find what truth is we are learning things so through learning they are approaching like learning is what everybody learns through life experiences and therefore we start approaching truth by trying to construct but the problem is you must be ready to unlearn if you want to learn otherwise the moment we get a degree and we believe we know that's the end of knowledge 
That's why someone said very beautifully that uh, education begins when your schooling has to finished. Something like that effect. True, uh, true knowledge begins when what you have learned you have forgotten. Then the true knowledge begins. So there are these students who are saying that you know we are learning. So what about the artist? He says I want. Um, uh, I am seeking for the truth of um, you know creativity and through creative passion he wants to engage in expressing all the things that he has realized and the pessimist also is searching for truth so pessimist says when i look at life all around it's so hopeless i want to know is there a truth and so on they start the journey so the first step the philanthropist stops or the pessimist stops pessimist says that you know i thought i'll search the truth but uh, i see no hope it's too difficult a journey i don't even know if there is anything at the end of it i see a bend there and a bend there here is there really a truth and he stops there and puts it his hand on the head and ends his search and he declares that there is nothing like truth is it true no why it is not true he didn't carry his search to the last extreme limit he saw a bend but he didn't venture he lacked courage he lacked faith he assumed that there is nothing who knows there is anything or not and so pessimist can't search for truth then there is another i mean they will search something and they will declare this is truth that's okay that's up to them nature takes them through their own way and then there is the philanthropist he says ah this is so wonderful i have climbed here till this point and i can help people but i see now the ascent is becoming steeper you see this ascent to truth even in our bharati park and here on the beach in pondicherry you will see a replica of mother's sketch ascent to truth so you see beyond a point the children will be climbing then you see suddenly there is a steep ascent so he says uh, well i see that you have to ascend this much to discover truth but if i do it i lose contact with the people and earth i want to help them not realizing that if you go further you can help much better see that is the whole principle idea of going into outer space there were there are people who say what is the point of going to outer space when people are hungry you should feed them precisely the reason because you you discover resources you discover powers energies forces which can really make your world much better so one has to go further but the philanthropist stops why because of his attachment with his idea of social service and human service it's a great attachment very difficult to get rid of that now what i mean by that is a philanthropic service that's what she says uh, providing giving money feeding the poor that is a higher kind of helping humanity which is to help humanity get rid of ignorance that's a different service altogether then the artist stops he says yeah i know this, this is so wonderful i can see that there are lovely mountains and maybe at the end you will find the truth but i am so much uh, full of all these beautiful scenes i am seeing on the hill let me just wait here and paint out the sketches and the search ends there entangled with the snare of forms beautiful form they are better forms than what the person finds on earth little ascent towards the hill then there is the scientist he is no 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 hold on you people are now madly going towards the summit first let us see what this is i'll analyze uh, maybe if i analyze this dust i will find the truth if i find i will tell you guys if you guys find tell me but i don't want to take this kind of impossible ascent which uh, something going beyond the clouds and it's all sounds to me fantastic so i am not going to go there so the scientist stop these are the four people who have stopped in the ascent then yeah, there are the students who are going students say we are learning moving and you know they are should we go this way that way and they stop and then there are the two lovers this is our search is for love <laughs> so it's very interesting they are happy just going going on that perfect love and then they reach a spot which is very beautiful and they say ah this is what we are looking for and they are very happy with each other and they stop their ascent the ascetic says no 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 there is something else and he goes for the enters into a barren place see the lovers and the ascetic they are at the same spot but one goes towards a cliff where there is nothing 
And he said, now I have found the last thing because beyond it there is nothing. And the lovers find beauty and joy and love. So for them also there is nothing. Actually beyond it you can't see the mountain. It's all in the clouds. That's how she puts it. Most human searches end here. But then there is the aspirants. And they say there is something. My heart tells me there is something more. We have not yet found the last wisdom. What is that last wisdom in which world and God grow true and one? We have left behind that. We have come up to here. We must find the last wisdom. So the other sadhak says, but we can't see anything. He says, yes, but we have to take the leap of faith. So that's where together they take the leap of faith. And when they take the leap of faith, they find that they are in the clouds where they discover the real glory. Glory of glory. So that's like going beyond the realm of human possibilities towards a possibility which is not yet manifested. So that brings in two aspects of truth. One is we arrive at the last bedrock of manifestation. Science, matter, you end up with whatever is the last point. And let's not qualify it. Uh, art, senses, sensation. Now this last bedrock of Manifested world is what is called in the parlance of yoga is the cosmic consciousness. All these truths reach there and find their place. But where does the cosmic egg come from? If one still has the search, one enters into that which is transcendent. And there one finds the last reconciling wisdom. That which is the source, in that all are united. And then we find the real meaning of every aspect of life. That's how the Upanishad describes truth as Chatushpad Brahman. So it's not just something deep within as the highest source which transcends all things, but it's also this whole cosmos, the dream world. It's also that which is manifested in the outward waking consciousness. And then it is that reality which holds all of them together, which cannot really be described. So all these different, different approaches, different ways must find that truth where they are united and harmonized. And if we look at it closely, it will give us even the secret of living beautifully. One of the problems of human nature is that human beings is not one of the problems, the problem as, as far as, is that there are different parts in us with different seekings. So ordinary in life, we have to pick up one strand, discard the others. Say yogi who says, I have to discover the truth to the path of the mind. He discards the heart's emotions. He stills them. He says, no, 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 no. Uh, emotion, senses, withdrawal from the sensory world. Physical body, it's insignificant. It's anyways a crooked tail. And through the mind he approaches and finds truth. What truth? One facet of truth. Out of which mind has emerged. But what happens to his heart and all? He... Till he is alive, he puts them, sits on the whirlpool. And all these parts are there. There is a kind of transaction which is involved, but they don't discover their real reality. We see that even in yogis. But those who seek through the heart, in whom the emotions are strong, they say, oh, he is supreme beloved. They seek the source of love. And when they seek the source of love, they find the source of love. And then those who are work-oriented, practical people, what I should do, tell me. In the vision of truth, what I should do. And when they seek through the path of will, by constantly turning the will inwards and offering it to the master of works, the one divine will which is operating in the cosmos, then they start uniting with that will. And they discover the truth of their own life. What is the truth of my own life? Very simple. What is the divine will in me? What is the purpose that God has put into my heart? And he is a very, very playful fellow. He puts different purposes in different hearts. Because each heart is at different stage of evolution. It's not a standard format. That we draw, you know, the same ticket in God's bureau. He doesn't involve in. He is he he loves variety. So your ticket is valid only for you. Somebody else's ticket is valid for that person. 
that takes us to yet another complexity so when we have discovered all these levels the heart seeks the divine lover the beloved the source of all love the source of that delight of existence which is there in love that beatitude and it discovers the lover of man the master of man and his infinite lover the mind discovered that truth which is vast luminous wisdom supernal which knows all things in a single vision which can cut through all the different plays of time and can see the whole thing at one single sweep and when the will discovers the divine will which is operating in this cosmos and within oneself then we can say that we are beginning to at least have some semblance of living a complete life how to find it the gita is about that and of course shri bindo's synthesis of yoga where he gives at great length through every part we must seek him or that or source call it whatever because if i have a feeling it must be having an origin so if i go back to its origin and, and we can actually reflect and see what is what does a human being seek in love he seeks perfect understanding care tenderness affection um, love blah not blah 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 that's not a good word love 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 in all its shades and <laughs> beauty and splendor and self giving and every union love is seeking union what is that ultimate urge for union where is it coming from because we live in a state of separation divided existence so ultimately it is seeking union with its own highest truth that union can fulfill us because that's the origin that's what love is seeking but because it's so difficult it starts seeking in a familiar discovers familiar splendors in an unknown face <laughs> and divine is okay because ultimately whichever way it's in another person in yourself in the world in any tom dick and harry if you want to go to the depth and seek the union with the truth inside the person you will touch the same bedrock so the divine allows this multiplicity of approaches but that seeking must be there it, you know, most of the time the difficulty with another person outside us is that the ego begins to rub and it creates uh, serious problems so it's not a very recommended method a more recommended method is andar jao go inside discover that fellow will not trouble you he will only draw you beautifully but then that leaves the problem of creation unsolved so you return back after receiving that love and you radiate that love you you multiply that union in a manifold ways just like the divine unites with creation in countless ways so you unite with creation with different different knowing the dharma of each one well that's a whole um big um, subject in its right and then with regard to the will when the will seeks the one divine will what what does it mean we have to withdraw from the clutch of desires preferences just like to discover the truth through the mind we have to get rid of all these opinions view points because opinions view points are like that tower of truth or even below brilliant ideas very good they help us but truth is beyond satya se aap hi tam mukham there is a this is the golden lid you have to pass beyond to see the face of the truth you cannot pass beyond by your own efforts that's why there is grace and the divine mother because up till there one can reach by tapasya assisted always by grace but without even active recognition but beyond it it cannot be forced open by any consciousness you are in that brahmand the cosmic egg you have reached the peak you are ready to be reborn but that door has to open by itself so that's why we see this prayer hiranmayana patrina satya sapi tamukam and when we seek through the heart then all other attachments they must change into true integers of love what is the difference in attachment we are wanting the person for our own sake selfish sake egoistic all attachments are born out of the ego that's why there are preferences all kinds of things if somebody is good to me i remain attached if somebody uh, is not so good to me then see how soon detachment develops it doesn't take sometimes even a moment two people who are very attached who are just blessed both in the court and outside the court 
that's why it's called courtship i think somebody named it so beautifully courtship so you go to a court and say we pledge that forever we'll be there in the house of god they will go kiss each other and come out and then something happens and this is, where is that fellow who can sign our divorce why this happens very interesting precisely because it's attachment they may have got attached but they have not love is not born but love is different it is independent of the object it rejoices in its own giving love is about the movement in me towards another yes in a relationship both are needed but that is you cannot decide that but within you you can have a movement of love so when we have that love turning toward the divine and receives everything from the divine then we can engage with the world and radiate this love all around and with the will we have to come out of the grip of desires i want this i want this all the different parts wanting 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 then this power which is dissipated in the world turns inward and it becomes a solid block and it says i have desired so many things but i have discovered the intelligent people don't need to go through the discovery maybe because they have discovered in a previous life none of this can eventually give me what i am really seeking so they turn the will toward the divine and they say you tell me what i am supposed to do so that's where one begins to unite with the divine will but in shobindo's yoga we go one step further why you want to leave behind the senses and the body they too must share the nectar which the will mind and heart are tasting so the body itself must aspire for the divine the senses must aspire literally for the delight meaning thereby they have to be disentangled from the way the senses are normally seeking crude stuff of joy senses are always seeking joy incidentally so instead of all that pleasure in which they are engaged when they turn inward and upward then they experience delight they become channels high line transparent channels for the flow of that delight of existence and of course the very body when it aspires when it rejects the idea of death and it aspires for that greater of which it is a shadow body is nothing but a reflection like an akriti it's a shadow it is deriving itself from a greater so in human in indian thought you have several bodies and the highest body is that in which this material body lives so strange so that body can that bliss body precipitate here crystallize here and when that aspiration awakens then we have the supramental yoga so all these are this vast canvas on which truth moves and uh, there is so much more and yet after we have said everything about truth one thing we must know not to try to define truth into any fixed mental formula the moment to define it you lose it if we are true seekers at whatever level in whatever way truth will meet us on the road but it's a difficult conquest it will challenge us it will invite us and if we are not ready it turns waits so it meets us as grace from that to this not a barren reality it's a living conscious fire tremendous fire and at the core of this fire is love what is love love is truth that has descended into earth to call us to draw us to help us in the journey so when we seek truth like that truth meets us wearing the beautiful face of love and when it carries us into the home of truth then love melts and dissolves into the body of bliss ananda we'll stop here Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Dr. Long. Is uh, by definition, is it is it uh, possible for science to, to 
to, to realize the truth or only an aspect? Yes, it has to, uh, I mean, it is definitely possible, but it has to upgrade its method. So, you know, the problem is that scientists fix themselves into a narrow group. Uh, but if they take it that well, um, the senses and reason, which is the faculty in ordinarily science uses, and it assumes that material reality is the sole reality, if it breaks free from this assumption, so meaning thereby it is ready to admit that there are sense beyond the sense. That's how, you know, we have the top-down view of the Kain Upanishad. And it admits that there are faculties beyond reason which man can access. And it admits that material world is not the only world. Meaning thereby it has to actually get rid of the three presumptions. It, by admitting I mean its faith must be vaster. Right now it approaches truth with a very limited faith. So it stops. It has discovered a virus and it stops. It has discovered the boson particle and it stops. I mean, it goes further, but again, uh, analyzing material things by the help of reason and the senses. So a time will come when this science will begin to graduate into a super science of tomorrow. So if it does that, yes, it will discover. It's destined to do it. It, it is bound to reach that point. Already one can see it's getting close to that. You cannot explain the material world fully without bringing in consciousness. So it is at the doorsteps. How do this is Shakun? Yes, Namaste Shakun. How do how Namaskar? How do we discover our inner truth and uh, grow according to it, the inmost truth, which is supposed to be our psychic? Yes. So. And how to grow blossom from that? in day-to-day -day life? This is my question. Yes, so uh, I have hinted at that, that, you know, to discover what is our own inner truth, I must seek for God's purpose in my life. Normally, this, this purpose, this one sentence I am using, one can use it differently. Normally, when we are born, we are given a certain purpose by society, by parents, by our upbringing and education. And in that process, all life is spent in trying to fulfill that. But what is God's purpose in me? And that sometimes in life we stand at those doors of crisis. When all these purposes and living life for those things lead us nowhere. You know, that's how the Gita starts. It doesn't help us. So a point comes when we face a kind of crisis wherein we really don't know whether the life I have led till now is really the life I was meant to lead. And it can lead to an existential crisis, even what can be called as a spiritual emergency nowadays or a kind of, you know, um, it, it can manifest even as a depression, undercurrent of depression. So not depression the way we understand it, but a kind of stifling sense. Now that's where one has to take the leap of faith and courage. Faith that well, there is something greater than all these purposes which I assumed and to have the courage to discover it which means sometimes dismantling all that one built around a kind of conception of life. You see, I'll give an example of a man who was actually a leader of a sect and quite a uh, you know, um, uh, a, a kind of master. I mean, he was regarded as a master by Guru, by his disciples. And he suddenly he turned towards Sri and he found it very interesting. And he used to come here, same, in the Gerwa dress and all that. So he would quietly come, spend some time. And he would come even for the Savitri talks. So one day I was telling him that, you know, uh, he knew that Sri Aurobindo is ultimate. I said, why don't you come and, you know, fully start exploring? He said, you know, I know that this is the ultimate truth. But the problem is that my disciples will be very disappointed. Now, just imagine the paradox. It kept him tied. Even when he knew. Because that entire thing has to be dismantled. So, the seeking for truth requires a tremendous courage. The courage and willingness to lose all that we are today to discover all that we are would be tomorrow and all that we are meant to be. So this courage is and faith is uh, very rare. So with this courage and faith, we must raise this question. Is the life that I am... Few questions which every day one should ask. 
Is this what I am meant to do? What I am doing? Is this the life I am meant to lead? That I am being, I am leading? What is it that the divine wants of me? And if we raise these questions regularly or from time to time, ultimately we will be led through the doorways and causeways and by lanes towards that great reality. That question becomes a quest and an aspiration. So we should aspire every day that, uh, Mother, what you want from me? And then that's one of the simplest ways. And if we can love her, then that's the straight road to the psyche being. But love happens, unfortunately or fortunately. You can't <laughs> make it. You can't say that, you know, you must love the mother and therefore... I mean, I know people who know, but they cannot love. Now that is a different aspect altogether. But at least we can raise the questions and have the quest. That is simpler and easier. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Sherlock, there's a, another yes. question. Um, it's uh, on the chat. Is the search of truth, is, is, to, if, is the search of truth to be developed or is it natural? Uh, if, to be, yeah. if to be developed, yeah. how, to be, how to begin? So that's a very interesting question, in fact, a very practical question. In a certain sense, man is meant to search for truth. It's it there in it's the sign of our humanity. That's why we have education. That's why we have all this uh, so-called human progress. Unlike the animal who is satisfied with his life as it is, but this search doesn't always take uh, express itself as a seeking for truth. It may take uh, the form of uh, you know arts for progress arts to know more. It may take many forms depending upon where we stand. The, in fact, the real hallmark of humanity is when this search begins to become conscious. Up till a time, this search is very, very subconscious. So it leads uh, man through one set of dissatisfaction to another, to another, another. Uh, this is how the normal progression takes place. But a time comes when man sees that, well, all this is okay, but what is reality? What is that truth? So this search can take many forms, doesn't matter. And that's where the conscious part begins. Now, how to really activate this search? Be with the seekers of truth. Shun the companies of those who are in the state of falsehood. A very, very simple, uh, you know, it may sound very judgmental, but this world is so much full of falsehood. It, it does everything to strengthen our falsehood. Go into the world and anywhere you see, you work in a place, you meet your you know, relatives, friends, family, everybody is strengthening that which is unrhythm. World is meant for desire, satisfy your desires. Or if you do this, you'll have more money, you can enjoy life, you can go to Paris, you can go to UK, you can go to wherever. If you do this, this, this is the advantage, all the calculations. It does everything to stifle this search. Till a time comes when one finds that, well, all these voices were misleading voices. Of course, at a higher level, truth works everywhere and in everything. But then it will like entering into post-graduation, even when we are not even in higher secondary. Mm -hmm. So, first step should be that one should shun the company of those which strengthen. There is a very nice, uh, you know, Guru Nanak sp uh, speaks like this. Sadho man ka man tyago. Oh man, shun this arrogant pride of the intellect if you want to search for truth. Oh, mind can know everything. Oh, I know it. Maybe Krishna may have said, Sri may have said, but I know things in my own way. This arrogance of the mind and the intellect. So he says, Sadho man ka man tyago and the next step is, Kama krodh sangati durajan ki taase ahanis bhago. People who are full of lust, greed, fear, anger, stay away from them because they will keep on covering this truth and its seeking by all kinds of things. So that's why the whole idea in Indian thought is of satsang. This is one of the forums, for instance, what uh, beautifully James you are arranging. They are not really lecture series. This is one way that we have satsang. We come together in the quest of truth. It awakens, it lights up the candles in each other. So it's so important to engage in satsang in one way or the other, hundred ways to do it and shun away from the company of those. It's not shunning from the world, but in reorienting oneself to the world. There are people who believe that they know all about the world and they will give all kinds of theories, philosophies, reasoning. 
stay away from that. And it's like a poison we drink. It does everything to stifle this search. And don't stop any halfway home of the spirit. Don't stop with religious belief. Don't stop by just reading a book. Don't stop by simply discussing and devoting and arguing and giving talks and listening to talks. Don't stop. Keep on seeking till one has found. And that one will know as a certitude in the heart and a vision in the entire being. And as Sri says, we are world and God, grow true and one. Then one has the dharma of dealing with each thing in its own way. How does God and world grow true and one? It's when we have the dharma. Dharma is the one that joins the two. From God's side, dharma is the evolutionary manifestation. From human side, the path that will lead him to union with the God. Okay. Yeah. Maybe the search, search for truth, it develops through like a, a disenchant, disenchantment or dissatisfaction with the ordinary existence. Yeah. You know, a, a, a yearning to go beyond yeah. and look deeper, you know. There's another question from Sarisha. Hello, yes, God. yes. How do we know truth in trivial things like organic food versus inorga inorganic, vaccinated versus unvaccinated, public schools versus Montessori? Very good question, what? Sarisha. <laughs> so this question was asked to the mother. This question can be answered at two levels. The first level is that, well, for that moment, we have to get back to the vision of truth. So, uh, when she was asked this question by a lady that how do we know that how much sugar I must put in my cup of tea? So, mothers laughed and said, well, you see, the divine is not interested in that. He is interested in the attitude with which you take the tea. So, initial thing should be attitude and it's very uh, simple to understand it. There are people who don't take vaccination. I, have, I mean, I can't publicly probably discover, de declare <laughs> what I have done or not done. <laughs> but the point is, but they are full of fear. They have not taken the vaccine because of fear and they don't do this out of fear. So, this is the basis. Where are there those who are full of faith? Similarly with organic and inorganic. So one approach is if I take, uh, you know, inorganic, I'll fall sick. Organic is the royal road, road to freedom. But anything that binds us to a certain condition cannot by definition be truth. Truth is freedom. In fact, truth is the only freedom. It gives freedom. Truth itself cures. So the first thing should be to discover that truth which doesn't depend on any of these things. You see, look at the ashram. People ask me that, you know, uh, even there are people who are connected and who talk about, uh, you know, leave milk and leave this and that. So I have a very simple answer. The staple diet in the ashram is milk started by the mother. And do we really believe that she didn't know what she is doing? So go beyond all these formations. They have their reality. So we can say that they are relative truths, temporary truths. They are angles of seeing at one thing. Very often when the mind picks up one aspect, it misses on others. So when one looks at organic, one sees all the advantage of organic. It's like when you fall in love with somebody, you just think, oh, this is wonderful, beautiful, beautiful. And you miss out on some somebody, <laughs> something else. So we must look at things in totality. There cannot be a perfect formula of life, whether organic or inorganic, Montessori or this, because the human beings are the same. I have seen Montessori schools. Human beings are the same. So ultimately, what is the uh, narrow goal, the limiting thing? is the human being. The same human being is using a method of Montessori. There is another human being who doesn't know even about Montessori. He doesn't know about any system. Live in his company. There is a very nice book, uh, Fridays with somebody. and Live in the company of such a person. You will see that you will grow in truth. He doesn't use any formula or method. Truth is beyond all formulas and methods. So any formula of mind will be by its nature inadequate. But yes, when you discover that which is in utter freedom and vastness, then one can know about these things. Then one can say, well, vaccination leads to this point and uh, the virus leads here and how to tackle them. But it should come from within. Till then, one has to rely on those who have discovered it. Uh, for instance, Shubhinder has spoken about vaccination, the virus. Then, till then, one has to rely. But the quest for the moment should be in that doesn't matter. Vaccine or no vaccine, vaccines are being forced. So, what can one do? One has very little choice. But either which way, 
let me search for that reality. That should be the whole approach. Yeah. Now Rashmi is asking. Yeah. Can yeah, I ask? Please, please. Nandini yes, here. Yes, namaste. Right. Yes, yeah? please. Yeah, please, yes. Nandini. So, uh, um, Dr. Yeah. Alok, uh, my question was um, when you said that, you know, to, to love the mother. Yes. Or when, when you say love, you know, in, in, in the language, like there's so many courses these days, they say, find your language, you know, language of love and things like that. But my question is here is, how do I know? Where do I understand that what, what is love? And beautiful. what could be, you know, very the, beautiful uh, question. Yes. Uh, definition. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. there's so many other things that, Truly, sometimes, yeah, as we are conditioned so much that... Uh, yeah, men, I think of all yeah, the this, words that human beings have defiled, <laughs> the one which they have defiled the most is love. You know, that John Keats, poem, Shelley's poem, that I cannot give you what men call love. Love has been turned into likes. Love has been turned into attachment. Love has been turned into how does it benefit me. Love has been turned into everything except love. But in one word, love can be, one can know love when there is the urge to give oneself. Because through giving, you want to unite. When you want to devour and unite, the urge in love is to unite. Then it's the most primitive form or expression of love. When you want, 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 extract from the other person. So what happens in the process? There is a parasite kind of relationship. There is dependency on one side and the other person gives and there is... It doesn't help anyone. That's not love. But people call it love. But its other extreme is where you give, give, give. And you unite by giving. But this giving cannot take place rightly till we are united with the inexhaustible source from where we are receiving. Otherwise, one will give and eventually finish oneself. So, love is the urge to give oneself and by giving, unite. And it seeks the joy and bliss of union, of identity. So the first step should be find the bliss of identity with the divine by giving oneself to the divine. When we do that, then by whatever means, you know, Indian thought has given various ways of by representative image, by deity, by guru or whatever means. It can be done in human love but far more difficult. Then you have to love only the divine in that person. Leave aside everything else. If we do it really sincerely, <laughs> sincerely then a time comes when we will cross the barriers of the ego. Mother says very beautifully, says if you truly love someone unselfishly, without expectations, you will at one point of time go past the barriers of the ego formation and you will touch the core of divine love in that person. And then you can really love truly. But love means by its nature self-giving. And therefore in real true love there is no disappointment because there is no expectation. You cannot be frustrated in love. There cannot be a failure in love because it's independent of everything. So, But of course, Thank you. Uh, not an easy sir. thing yes. for human nature. Nothing yeah. is easy for that matter. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. One loves for the sake of loving. Yeah. Uh, Rashmi has a yes, question. Rashmi. I'll just abbreviate it a little bit. Um, how to keep the awareness of truth all the time while walking on the path? If one has found the truth, then the question, uh, you know, first one has to find the truth. But yes, the question that how to keep the awareness of truth when one is walking the path. Once you have found it, the method is very easy. Because you will see the moment you are deviating from that, there will be a veiling of consciousness. And, and yeah, and that... Yeah, and, and veiling the consciousness will lead to certain consequences immediately. For instance, sadness, depression, anxieties, all these means that we have cut ourselves from the perennial source of delight and harmony. Truth by its nature is supreme harmony and delight. So, if we are deviating from it, we'll know. And therefore, we should get back to that search, that point where we once again emerge into that freedom, that peace, that joy, delight, not joy, delight of existence, which is there in everything. That unconditional love. So these are all different aspects of uh, truth. So this is how one can know that one is no more in awareness of truth. 
If one is depressed, one knows one has deviated. If one is extremely anxious, that means one has deviated. If one has got into that whirlpool of, uh, you know, if the peace is disturbed in its place, there is agitation, one has deviated. What one should do then is to sit quietly, take time out, get back to that, reconnect with that, and then one's back bounce upon life. Sometimes if the load is too heavy, take time out for a few days. Go to Nainital, shut yourself in a room in Pondicherry. And <laughs> I mean, I'm just telling you, or a will, anywhere. And get back. This I'm saying if one has found, then there's a question of losing awareness. And otherwise, if one has not found, don't stop at any halfway homes, however beautiful they may seem. Don't stop at half certitudes. Because they are all proviso. One can use them, take it, that yes, one has to accept truth of the moment, but as a step toward the ultimate truth. So one loves somebody. Let's take that example. One feels the feeling of love. If one says, I found ultimate, well, one may well be led into a kind of trap door. But when one uses that opportunity not to find somebody else, but say, let me upgrade my feeling of love. How much can I love truly and beautifully? Then one is progressing. So not to stop anywhere in the halfway home of the spirit. Not to be, uh, otherwise human love, if both people love each other, there is a joy, a kind of joy. But it may stifle the seeking for true love. That's why the divine has so beautifully organized life. And I don't want to go say further. <laughs> Thank you, Dada. Thank you so okay. much. Thank you. Yeah, but uh, just just a uh, simple point, actually. Yeah, there is a lot of disquiet when uh, I go from that yes, center, when yes. I forget, forget the mother. Absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, but, but Dada, actually, <laughs> a lot of work when it is there, uh, you know, at times situations have become... Uh, so, so, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. So, see, ideal situation is where we are concentrated in the heart and, you know, working outside. But as you rightly say, one tends to forget. One tends to get overburdened. Yeah, yeah. yes, so, sir. that's yeah. why there is a need yeah. for taking time out separately. When one can really uh, take out time and every day take a spiritual bath. Till one day, one is so firmly established in truth. That happens when one has discovered the psychic being. Then one knows this is me and this nature. It's very easy to step back. It's like a room which is open. And any time one can step back. So one should keep on searching towards that. Finally, till there is a full awakening of the psychic being within and one is identified. Then there is no problem. Because any arena of nature one goes. Even the darkest territories, one can just step back and enter into this room. So that, stick out a separate time and make that as the primary goal. And then one day one is established fully in it. Wonderful, Allah. Even this is attending this course itself is an act of uh, grace of the mother. I always think in that. Thank way. you. Thank you, Allah. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, James. Yes, I think we'll, we'll call it a day. We're reaching the end of our time. So thank you very much for a most illuminating talk, Dr. Locke. It was 